Chapter 1 of Fern's Hollow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Johnson. Fern's Hollow by Heshpa Stretton. Chapter 1. Just upon the border of Wales, but within one of the English counties, there is a cluster of hills rising one above the other in gradual slopes until the summits form a long, broad tableland many miles across. This tableland is not so flat that all of it can be seen at once, but here and there there are little dells, shaped like deep basins, which the country folk call hollows, and every now and then there is a rock or hillock covered with yellow gorse bushes, from the top of which can be seen the wide, outspread plains where hundreds of sheep and ponies are feeding, which belong to the farmers and cottagers dwelling in the valley below. Besides the chief valley, which divides the mountains into two groups, and which is broad enough for a village to be built in, there are long, narrow glens stretching up into the very heart of the tableland, and draining away the waters which gather there by the melting of snow in the winter and the rain of thunderstorms in summer. Down every glen flows a noisy mountain stream, dashing along its rocky course, with so many tiny waterfalls and impatient splashes, that the gurgling and bubbling of brooks come up even into the quietness of the tableland and mingle with the singing of the birds and the humming of the bees among the heather. There are not many paths across the hills except the narrow sheep walks worn by the tiny feet of the sheep as they follow one another in long single lines winding in and out through the clumps of the gorse, and few people care to explore the solitary plains except the shepherds who have the charge of the flocks and tribes of village children who go up every summer to gather the fruit of the wild and hardy bilberry wires. The whole of the broad tableland, as well as the hills, are common pasture for the inhabitants of the valleys, who have an equal right to keep sheep and ponies on the uplands with the lord of the manor. But the property of the soil belongs to the latter, and he only has the power of enclosing the waste, so as to make fields and plant woods upon it provided always that he leaves a sufficient portion for the use of the villagers. In times gone by, however, when the lord of the manor and his agent were not very watchful, it was the practice of poor persons who did not care how uncomfortably they lived to seek out some distant hollow or the farthest and most hidden safe side of a hillock, and there they built themselves such a low, small hut as should escape the notice of any passer-by should they chance to go that way. Little by little, making low fences which looked like the surrounding gorse bushes, they enclosed small portions of the wasteland, or, as it is called, encroached upon the common, and if they were able to keep their encroachment without having their hedges broken down, or if the lord of the manor neglected to demand rent for it for the space of twenty years, their fields and gardens became securely and legally their own. Because of this right, therefore, are to be found here and there little farms of three or four fields apiece, looking like islands with the wide, open common around them. And some miles away over the breezy uplands, there is even a little hamlet of these poor cottages, all belonging to the people who dwell in them. Many years ago, even many years before my story begins, a poor woman, who was far worse off than a widow, for her husband had just been sentenced to transportation for twenty-one years, stray down to these mountains upon her sorrowful way home to her native place. She had only her child with her, a boy five years of age, and from some reason or another, perhaps because she could not bear to go home in shame and disgrace, she sought out a very lonely hiding place among the hills, and with her own hands reared rough walls of turf and stones until she had formed such a rude hut as would just give shelter unto her and the boy. There they lived, uncared for and solitary, until the husband came back, after suffering his twenty-one years' punishment, and entered into a little spot of land entirely his own. Then, with the assistance of his son, a strong, full-grown man, he rebuilt the cottage, though upon a scale not much larger or much more commodious than his wife's old hut. Like other groups of mountains, the highest and largest are those near the center, and from them the land descends in lower and lower levels, with smaller hills and smoother valleys, until at length it sinks into the plain. Then they are almost like children's hills and valleys. The slopes are not too steep for very little feet to climb, and the rippling brooks are not in so much hurry to rush on to the distant river, 
but that boys and girls at play can stop them for a little time with slight banks of mud and stones in just such a smooth sloping dell down in a soft green basin called ferns hollow was the hiding place where the convict's sad wife had found an unmolested shelter this dwelling the second one raised by the returned convict and his son is built just below the brow of the hill so that the back of the hut is formed of the hill itself and only the sides in front are real walls these walls are made of rubble or loose unhewn stones piled together with a kind of mortar which is little more than clay baked hard in the heat of the sun the chimney is a bit of old stovepipe scarcely rising above the top of the hill behind and but for the smoke we could look down the pipe as through the tube of a telescope upon the family sitting round the hearth within the thatch overgrown with moss appears as a continuation of the slope of the hill itself and might almost deceive the simple sheep grazing around it instead of a window there is only a square hole covered by a shutter when the light is not urgently needed and the door is so much too small for its sill and lintels as to leave large chinks through which the adventurous bees and beetles may find their way within you may see at a glance that there is but one room and that there can be no upstairs in the hut except that upper story of the broad open common behind it where the birds sleep softly in their cosy nests before the house is a garden and beyond that a small field sown with silver oats which are dancing and glistening in the breeze and sunshine while before the garden wicked but not enclosed from the common is a warm sunny valley in the very middle of which a slender thread of a brook widens into a lovely little basin of a pool clear and cold the very first place for the hill ponies to come and drink looking steadily up this pleasant valley from the threshold of the cottage we can just see a fine light film of white smoke against the blue sky two miles away right down off the mountains there is a small coal field and a quarry of limestone in a distinct part of the country there are large tracts of land where coal and iron pits are sunk in on every side and their desolate and barren pit banks extend for miles around while a heavy cloud of smoke hangs always in the air but here just at the foot of these mountains there is one little seam of coal as if placed for the express use of these people living so far away from the larger coal fields the bot field lime and coal works cover only a few acres on the surface but underground there are long passages bored beneath the pleasant pastures and the yellow cornfields from the mountains botfield looks rather like a great blot upon the fair landscape with its blackened engine house and banks of coal dust its long range of lime kilns sultry and quivering in the summer sunshine and its heavy groaning water wheel which pumps up the water from the pits below but the colliers do not think it so nor their wives in the scattered village beyond they do not consider the lime and coal works a blot for their living depends upon them and they may rightly say as for the earth out of it cometh bread and under it is turned up as if it were fire even stephen fern who would a thousand times rather work out on the free hillside than in the dark passages underground does not think it a pity that botfield pit has been discovered at the foot of the mountains it is nearly seven o'clock in the evening and he is coming over the brow of the green dell with his long shadow stretching down it a very long shadow it is for so small a figure to cast for if we wait a minute or two till stephen draws nearer we shall see that he is no strong large man but a slight thin stooping boy bending rather wearily under a sack of coals which he is carrying on his shoulders and pausing now and then to wipe his heated forehead with the sleeve of his collier's flannel jacket when he lifts up the latch of his home we will enter with him and see the inside of the hut at ferns hollow end of chapter one recorded by matthew johnson chapter two of ferns hollow this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Johnson. Ferns Hollow by Heshpa Stretton. Chapter 2. 
Stephen stepped over the threshold into a low, dark room which was filled with smoke from a sudden gust of the wind as it swept over the roof of the hut. On one side of the grate, which was made of some half-hoops of iron fastened into the rock, there was a very aged man, childish and blind with years, who was crouching towards the fire and talking and chuckling to himself. A girl, about a year older than Stephen, sat in a rocking chair and swung to and fro as she knitted away fast and diligently at a thick gray stocking. In the corner nearest to the fireplace, there stood a pallet bed hardly raised above the earthen floor, to which Stephen hastily, immediately, with an anxious look at the thin, white face of his father lying upon the pillow. Beside the sick man there lay a little child fast asleep, with her hand clasping one of her father's fingers, and though James Fern was shaking and trembling with a violent fit of coughing from the sudden gust of smoke, he took care not to lose hold of those tiny fingers. "'Poor little Nan,' he whispered to Stephen, as soon as he could speak. I've been thinking all day of her and thee, lad, till I'm nigh heartbroken. Do you feel worse for wear, father? asked Stephen anxiously. I'm drawing nearer the end, answered James Fern. Nearer the end every hour, and I don't know for certain what the end will be. I'm repenting, but I can't undo the mischief I've done. I must leave that behind me. If I had been anything like a decent father, I should have left you comfortable instead of poor beggars. And what is to become of my poor lass here? See how fast she clips my hand. As if she was afeard I was going to leave her. Oh, Stephen, my lad, what will you do? Father, said Stephen in a quiet, firm voice, I'm getting six shillings a week wages, and we, we can live on very little. We haven't got any rent to pay, and only ourselves and grandfather to keep. And, and Martha is as good as a woman grown. We'll manage, father, and take care of little Nan. Stephen and I are not bad, father, added Martha, speaking up proudly. I am not like Black Bess of Botfield. Mother always told me I was to do my duty, and I always do it. I can wash and sew and iron and bake and knit. Why... Often and often we've had no more than Stephen's earnings when you've been to the Red Lion on reckoning nights. Hush, hush, Martha, whispered Stephen. No, it's true, groaned the dying father. God Almighty have mercy on me. Stephen, hearken to me and thee too, Martha, while I tell you about this place and what you are to do when I'm gone. He paused for a minute or two looking earnestly at the crouching old man in the chimney corner. "'Grandfather's quite simple,' he said, "'and he's dark, too, "'and doesn't know what any one is saying, "'but I know they'll be good to him, Stephen. "'Hearken, children. "'Your poor old grandfather was once in jail "'and was sent across the seas for a thief.' "'Father!' cried Stephen in a tone of deep distress, "'and he turned quickly to the old man, remembering how often he had sat upon his knees by the winter fire, and how many summer days he had rambled with him over the uplands after the sheep. His grandfather had been far kinder to him than his own father, and his heart swelled with anger as he went and laid his arm round the bending neck of the old man, who looked up in his face and laughed heartily. "'Come back, Stephen, it's true,' gasped James Fern. "'Poor mother and me came here where nobody knew us, and—' while he was away for more than twenty years, and she built a hut for us to live in till he came back. I was a little lad then, but as soon as I was big enough, she made me learn to read and write, that I might send letters to him beyond the seas, and none of the neighbors know. She'd often make me read to her about a poor fellow who had left home and gone off to a far country, and when he came home again, how his father saw him a long way off. Well... She was just like that when she'd heard that he had landed in England. She did not but sit over the bent of the hill yonder, peering along the road to Botfield. And one evening at sundown she saw something, little more than a speck upon the turf. And she'd a feeling come over her that it was he, and she fainted for real joy. 
After all, we weren't much happier than when we were settled down like. Grandfather had learned to tend sheep out yonder, and I worked at Bodfield, but we never laid by money to build a brick house as poor mother always wanted us. She died a month or so before I was married to your mother. James Fern sat silent for some minutes, leaning back upon his pillow with his eyes closed and his thoughts gone back to the old times. If I'd only been like mother, you'd have a hill farmer now, Steve, he continued in a tone of regret. She plotted out in her own mind to take in the green before us for rearing young lambs and tucks and goslings. But I was like that poor lad that wasted all his substances and riotous living, and I've let thee and thy sister grow up without even the learning I could have given thee, and the learning that is light carriage. But, lad, remember, this house is thy own, and never part with it, never give it up, for it is thy right. Maybe they'll want to turn thee out, because thee art a boy, but I've lived in it nigh upon forty years, and I've written it all down upon this piece of paper. And that the place is thine, Stephen. I'll never give it up, father said Stephen in a steady voice. Stephen, continued his father, the master has set his heart upon it to make it a hill farm, and thou'lt have to work hard to hold thine own against him. Thou must frame thy words well when he speaks to thee about it, for he is a cunning man. And there's another paper, which the parson at Danesford has in his keeping, to certify that mother built this house and dwelt in it all the days of her life, more than thirty years, if there's any mischief worked against thee, go to him for it. And now, Stephen, wash thyself, and get thy supper, and then let's hear thee read thy paper. Stephen carried his basin of potatoes to the door sill and sat there, with his back turned to the dimsel hut and his dying father, and his face looking out upon the green hills. He had always been a grave and thoughtful boy, and he had much to think of now. The deep sense of new duties and obligations that had come upon him with his father's words made him feel that his boyhood had passed away. He looked round upon the garden and the field and the hut with the keen eye of an owner, and he wondered at the neglected state into which they had fallen since his father's illness. There could be no more playtime for him, no birds nesting among the gorse bushes, no rabbit hunting with Snip, the little white terrier that was sharing his supper. If little Nan and his grandfather were to be provided for, he must be a man, with a man's thoughtfulness, doing a man's work. There seemed enough work for him to do in the field and garden alone without his twelve hours' toil in the coal pit, but his weekly wages would now be more necessary than ever. He must get up early and go to bed late, and labor without a moment's rest, doing his utmost from one day to another, with no one to help him or stand for a little while in his place. For a few minutes his brave spirit sank within him, and all the landscape swam before his eyes, while Snip took advantage of his master's inattention and put his nose into the basin and helped himself to the largest share of potatoes. I mean to be like grandmother, said Martha's clear, sharp voice close behind him, and he saw his sister looking eagerly round her. I shall fence the green in and have lambs and sheep to turn out in the hillside, and I'll rear young goslings and ducks for the market, who'll have a brick house with two rooms in it, as well as a shed for the coal, and nobody shall put upon us or touch our rights, Stephen, for they shall have the length of my tongue. Martha, said Stephen earnestly, do you see how a shower is raining down on the master's fields at Botfield, and they've been scorched up for want of water? Well, yes, surely, answered Martha, and what of that? I'm thinking, continued Stephen rather shyly, of that verse in my chapter. He maketh the sun to rise on the evil and good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. What sort of man is the master, Martha? He's a bad, unjust, niggerly old miser, replied Martha. And if God sends him rain, and takes care of him, Stephen said, how much more will he take care of us if we are good and try to do his commandments? I should think, said Mark a bit in a softer tone, I should really think he would give us the green and the lambs and, and the new house and everything, for both of us are good, Stephen. I don't know, replied Stephen. If I could read all the Bible, perhaps it would tell us. But now I must go in and read my chapter to Father. 
Martha went back to her rocking chair and knitting, while Stephen reached down from a shelf an old Bible covered with green bays, and having carefully looked at his hard hands, which were quite clean, he opened it with the greatest reverence. James Fern had only begun to teach the boy to read a few months before, when he felt the first fatal symptoms of his illness, and Stephen, with his few opportunities for learning, had only mastered one chapter, the fifth chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel, which his father had chosen for him to begin with. The sick man lay still with closed eyes, but listened attentively to every word, and correcting his son whenever he made any mistake. When it was finished, James Fern read aloud a few verses himself, with a low voice and frequent pauses to regain his strength, and very soon afterwards the whole family were in a deep sleep, except himself. End of chapter 2 Recorded by Matthew Johnson Chapter 3 Ferns Hollow This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are recorded in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Johnson. Ferns Hollow, written by Heshpa Stretton. Chapter 3 James Fern did not have many more days, and he was buried the Sunday following his death. All the colliers and pitmen from Botfield walked with the funeral of their old comrade and made a great burial of it. The parish church was two miles on the other side of the botfield, and four miles from Fern's Hollow. So James Fern and his family had never, as he had called it, troubled the church with their attendance. All the household, even to little Nan, went with their father's corpse, to bury it in the strange and distant churchyard. Stephen felt as if he was in some long and painful dream, as he sat in the cart with his feet resting upon his father's coffin, with his grandfather on a chair at the head, nodding and laughing at every jolt on the rough road, and Martha holding a handkerchief up to her face, and carrying a large umbrella over herself and little Nan, to keep the dust off their new black bonnets. The boy, grave as he was, could hardly think. He felt in too great a maze for that. The church, too, which he had never entered before, seemed grand and cold and immense, with its lofty arches and a roof so high that it made him giddy to look up at it. Now and then he heard a few sentences of the burial service sounding out grandly in the clergyman's strange but deep voice, but they were not words he was familiar with, and he could not understand their meaning. At the open grave only the clergyman said, Our Father, which his father had taught him during his illness, and while tears rolled down his cheeks for the first time that day, Stephen repeated over and over again to himself, Our Father, our Father. Stephen would have liked to stay in the church for the evening service, for which the bells were already ringing, but this did not at all suit the taste of his father's comrades. They made haste to crowd into a public house, where they sat and drank and forced Stephen to drink too, in order to drown his grief. It was a still, painful dream to him, and more and more as the long hours passed on, he wondered how he came there, and what all the people about him were doing. It was quite dark before they started homewards, and the poor old grandfather was no longer able to sit up in his chair, but lay helplessly at the bottom of the cart. Even Martha was fast asleep, and leaned her head upon Stephen's shoulder, without any regard for her new black bonnet. The cart was now crowded with as many of the people as could get into it, who sang and shouted along with the quiet Sunday road, and, as they insisted upon stopping at every public house they came to, it was very late before they reached the lane leading up to Fern's Hollow. The grandfather was half dragged and half carried by the two of the men, followed by Stephen, now bearing sleepy little Nan in his arms, and by Martha, who had wakened up in a temper between crying and scolding. The long, strange, painful dream of his father's funeral was not over yet, and Stephen was still trying to think in a stupid, drowsy fashion, when he fell heavily asleep on the bed beside his grandfather. He awoke by habit very early in the morning, and aroused himself with great effort against dropping asleep again. He could realize and understand his position better now. Father was dead. 
and there was no one to earn bread from the mall but himself. At this thought he sprang up instantly, though his head was aching in a manner that he had never felt before. With some difficulty he awoke Martha to get his breakfast and put up his dinner in a basket, which he carried with him to the pit. She also complained bitterly of her head aching, and moved about with a listlessness very different to her usual activity. I only wish I knew what was right, said Stephen to himself. They told us we ought to show respect for Father, but I don't think he'd like this. Perhaps I could read the Bible all through. That would tell me everything. This thought reminded Stephen that he had promised his father to read his chapter every day of his life till he knew how to read more, and carrying the old Bible to his favorite seat on the door, a very pleasant place in the cool, fresh summer morning. He read the verses aloud, slowly and carefully, rather repeating than reading them, for he knew his chapter better by heart than by the printed letters in the book. Thank God Stephen Fern did begin to know it by heart. It was not a bad day in the pit. All the colliers, men, and boys were more gentle than usual with the fatherless lad, and even Black Thompson, his master since his father's illness, who was in general a fierce bully to everybody about him, spoke as mildly as he could to Stephen. Yet all the day Stephen longed for his release in the evening, thinking about how much work there wanted to be doing in the garden, and how much he and Martha must be still busy there until nightfall. The clanking of the chain which drew him up to the light of day sounded like music to him, but little did he guess that an enemy was lying in wait for him at the mouth of the pit. Hilio! cried a voice down from the shaft as they were nearing the top. One of you chaps have got to carry a sack of coals one mile. The voice belonged to Tim Cole, who was one of the terror of the pit bank. From his love of mischief and his insatiable desire for fighting, he was looking down at the shaft now, with a grin and a laugh upon his red face, round which his shaggy red hair hung like a rough mane. There were only two other boys besides Stephen in the skip, and as their fathers were with them, it might be dangerous to meddle with them, so Tom fixed upon Stephen as his prey. "'Thee's got to carry these coals, Steve,' he said, his eyes dancing with delight. "'I won't,' replied Stephen. "'Thee shalt,' cried Tim with an oath. "'I won't,' Stephen repeated steadfastly. "'Then we'll fight for it,' said Tim, clenching his fists and squaring his arms, while the men and boys formed a ring around the two lads and one and another spoke encouragingly to Stephen, who was somewhat slighter and younger than Tim. He had beaten Tim once before, but that was months ago, yet the blood rushed into Stephen's face, and he set his lips together firmly. Up yonder, just within the range of his sight, was Fern's Hollow, with its neglected garden and his supper waiting for him, and here was the heavy sack of coals to be carried for a mile, or was the choice of fighting with Tim. I wish I knew what I ought to do, he said, speaking aloud, though speaking to himself. Aye, aye, lad, cried Black Thompson. It's a shame to make thee fight, and thy father not cold in the graveyard yet. I say, Tim, what is it thee wants? These coals, answered Tim doggedly, are to be carried to the new farm. And if Steve Fern won't take them one mile, he must fight me afore he goes off to this bank. No, lads. I'll be the judge between ye this time, said Black Thompson. Stevie shall carry them to the inn of Red Lane and cut across the hill home. That's not much out of the way, and if Tim makes him go one step farther, I'll lick thee myself tomorrow, lad, I promise thee. Stephen hoisted the sack upon his shoulders in silence and strode away with a swelling heart in which a tumult of anger and perplexity was raging. If I had only a commandment about these things, he thought. He was not quite certain whether it would not have been best and wisest to fight with Tim and have it out, especially as Tim was all the time taunting him for being a coward. But his father had read much to him during the last three months, and though he could not remember any particular commandment, he felt sure that the Bible did not encourage fighting or drunkenness. Suddenly, and before they reached the end of the Red Lane, a light burst upon Stephen's mind. I say, Tim, he said, speaking to him for the first time, it's four miles to the new farm, and I'll go with thee a mile farther than Red Lane. Eh, cried Tim, 
and get Black Thompson to lick me tomorrow? No, said Stephen earnestly. I'll not tell Black Thompson, and if he hears talk of it, I'll say I did it of my own mind. Come thy ways, Tim. Let's be sharp, for I've my potatoes to hoe when I get home tonight. The boys walked briskly on for a few minutes, past the end of Red Lane, though Stephen cast a wistful glance up at it and gave an impatient jerk to the load upon his shoulders. Tim had been walking beside him in silent reflection, but at last he came to a sudden halt. "'I can't make it out,' he said. "'What art thee up to, Stephen? "'Tell me out plain, or I'll fight thee here, "'if Black Thompson does lick me for it.' "'Why, I've been learning to read,' answered Stephen, with some pride. "'And of course I know things I didn't used to know, "'and what thee doesn't know now.' "'And what's that supposed to do with it?' inquired Tim. My chapter says that if any man forces me to go one mile, I am to go two, replied Stephen. It doesn't say why exactly, but I'm going to try what good it will be to me to do everything that my book tells me. It's a queer book, said Tim after a pause. Does it say a chap may make another chap do his work for him? No, Stephen answered, but it does say that we are to love our enemies and do good to them that hate us that we may be the children of our Father, which is in heaven. That, that's God, Tim. So that is why I am going a mile farther with thee. I don't hate thee, said Tim uneasily, but I do love fighting. I'd rather thee fight than to come another mile. Don't thee come any farther. I've been a bone lazy all day, and thee's been at work. And I say, Stevie, I'll help thee tomorrow with the potatoes to make up for this bout. Stephen thanked him and accepted his offer heartily. The load was quickly transferred to Tim's broad back, and the boys parted in more goodwill than they had ever felt before. Stephen strengthened this by favorable result in his resolution to put in practice all he knew of the Bible, and Tim, deep in thought, as was evident from his muttering every now and then, on his way to the new farm. Queer book, that, and a queer chap, too. End of chapter 3 Recording by Matthew Johnson Chapter 4 of Fern's Hollow This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Fern's Hollow by Hesba Stretton. Chapter Four Threatening Clouds. Little Nan would be waiting for him, as well as his supper, and Stephen forgot his weariness as he bounded along the soft turf, to the great discomfiture of the brown faced sheep, quite as anxious for their supper as he was for his. Stephen heard far off Snip's sharp, impatient bark and it made him quicken his step still more, until, coming within sight of his own hollow, he stopped suddenly, and his heart beat even more vehemently than when he was running up the hillside. There was, however, nothing very terrible in the scene. The hut was safe, and the sun was shining brightly upon the garden, and little Nan was standing as usual at the wicket, only in the oat field where their faces looking across the green so two men in close conversation these men were both of them old and rather thin and shriveled in figure their features bore great resemblance to each other the eyes being small and sunken with many wrinkles round them and both mouths much fallen in you would have said at once they were brothers, and if you drew near enough to hear their conversation, you would have found your guess was right. "'Brother Thomas,' said the thinnest and sharpest looking, "'I intend to enclose as far as we can see from this point. That southern bank will be a first-rate place for young animals. I shall build a house, with three rooms above and below, besides a small dairy, and I shall plant a fir wood behind it, to keep off the east winds the lime and bricks from my own works will not cost me much more than the expense of bringing them up here 
and a very pretty little hill farm you'll make of it james replied thomas wyly admiringly i should not wonder now if you got twenty pounds a year rent for it i shall get twenty-five pounds in a few years said the other one just think of the run for ponies on the hill to say nothing of sheep a young hard-working man could make a very tidy living up here and we shall have a respectable house instead of a pauper's family it will be a benefit to the neighbourhood observed thomas wyly the latter speaker who was a degree pleasanter looking than his brother was the relieving officer of the large union to which botfield belonged and in consequence all poor persons who had grown too old or were in any way unable to work were compelled to apply to him for the help which the laws of our country provide for such cases james wyly the elder brother was the owner of botfield works and the master of all the people employed in them besides being the agent of the lord of the manor so both these men possessed great authority over the poor and they used the power to oppress them and grind them down to the utmost it was therefore no wonder that stephen stopped instantly when he saw their well-known figures standing at the corner of his oat-field nor that he should come on slowly after he had recovered his courage pondering in his own mind what they were come up to fern's hollow for and how he should answer them if they should want him to give up the old hut good evening my lad said james wyly smiling a slow reluctant smile as stephen drew near to them with his cap in his hand so you buried your father yesterday i hear poor fellow there was not a better collier at botfield than james fern never troubled his parish for a sixpence added thomas wyly thank you master said stephen the tears starting to his eyes so unexpected was this gentle greeting to him i'll try to be like father well my boy said thomas wyly we are come up here on purpose to give you our advice as you are such a mere lad i've been thinking what can be done for you there's your grandfather a poor simple helpless old man and the little girl why of course we shall have to receive them into the house and i'll see there is no difficulty made about it and then we intend to get your sister into some right good service i should not mind taking her into my own house said the master mr james wyly she would soon learn under my niece anne so you'll be set free to get your own living without encumbrance you are earning your six shillings now and that will keep you well please sir answered stephen we mean to live all together as we've been used to and i couldn't let grandfather and little nan come upon the parish martha must stay at home to mind them and i'll work my fingers to the bone for them all sir many thanks all the same to you for coming up here to see after us very fine indeed my little fellow said thomas wyly but you don't understand what you're talking about it is my place to see after the poor and i cannot leave you in charge of such a very old man and such a child as this no no they must be taken care of and they'll be made right comfortable in the house father said replied stephen that i was never to let grandfather and little nan come upon the parish i get my wages and we've no rent to pay and the potatoes and oats will help us and martha can pick bilberries on the hill and carry bundles of firings to the village and we'll do well enough without the parish many thanks all the same to you sir hark ye my lad said the master impatiently i want to buy your old hut and field from you i'll give ye a ten pound note for it a whole ten pounds why a fortune for you father said repeated stephen i was never to give up fern's hollow and i gave him a sure promise for that and to take care of little nan as long as ever i lived fern's hollow is none of yours cried the master in a rage you've just been a family of paupers and squatters living up here by poaching and thieving i'll unearth you i promise ye you have been a disgrace to the manor long enough 
so it is ten pounds or nothing for your old hole and you may take your choice please sir said stephen firmly the place is ours and i'm never to part with it i'll never poach and i'll never trespass on the manor but i can't sell the old house sir now just listen to me young fern said thomas wyley you'll be compelled to give up fern's hollow in right of the lord of the manor and then if you come to the house for relief mark my words i'll send your grandfather off to bristol for that's his parish and you'll never see him again and i'll give orders for you never to see little nan and i'll apprentice you and your other sister in different places so you'd better be reasonable and take our advice while you could be made comfortable please sir i can't go against my promise answered stephen with a sob what's the use of wasting one's breath said the master this place i want and this place i'll have and we'll see if that young jailbird will stand in my way ah my fine fellow it's no such secret where your grandfather spent twenty-one years of his life and you'll have a sup of the same broth some day you don't keep a dog like that yelping cur for nothing and i'll tell the gamekeeper to have his eye upon you stephen stood motionless watching them down the narrow path which led to botfield until a rabbit started from beneath the hedge and snip with a sharp short bark of excitement gave it chase in the direction of the two men the master paused and looking back shook his stick threateningly at the motionless figure of the boy while thomas wyley threw a stone at the dog which sent him back yelping piteously to his young master's feet stephen clenched his hands and bit his lips till the blood started but he did not move till the last glimpse of his foes had passed away from the hillside martha had hidden herself in the hut while they were present for she had never spoken to the dreaded master but she could overhear their loud and angry speeches and now she came out and joined stephen well i'd have more spirit than to cry she said as stephen brushed his eyes with his sleeve i'd never have spoken so gingerly to them the wizen-faced old rascals the place is ours and they can't turn us out it's no use to be cowed by them stephen they can turn me off the works answered stephen sadly and whatever shall we do then asked martha in alarm still i reckon you'll say we're to love those old wretches the book says so replied stephen well i won't set up to try to do it for one continued martha decisively it's not nature it's being over good by half i'm willing to do my duty by you and grandfather and little nan but that goes beyond me if you just give way stevie and give them a good rating you'll feel better after it i don't know that he answered walking gloomily towards the door he felt so much passion and anger within him that it did seem as if it would be a relief to utter some of the terrible oaths which he heard frequently in the pit and which had been familiar enough in his own mouth a few months ago but now other words familiar from daily reading the words that he had repeated to tim so short a time before were being whispered as it seemed close by his ear love your enemies bless them that curse you do good to them that hate you pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you there was a deadly conflict going on in the boy's soul and martha's angry words were helping the tempter he sat down despondently on the door sill and hid his face in his hands while he listened to his sister's taunts against his want of spirit and her fears that he would give up their home for his new notions he was about to answer her at last with the passion she was trying to provoke when a soft little cheek was pressed against his downcast head and little nan lisped in her broken words me sleepy stevie me say our father and go to bed the child knelt down before him and laid her folded hands upon his knee as she had done every evening since his father died while he said the prayer 
and she repeated it slowly after him he felt as though he were praying for himself a feeling of deep earnestness came over him and though his voice faltered as he said softly forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us it seemed as if there was a spirit in his heart agreeing to the words and giving him power to say them he did not know then that the spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered but while he prayed with little nan he received great comfort and strength though he was ignorant of the source from whence they came when the child's prayers were ended he roused himself cheerfully to action and as long as the lingering twilight lasted both stephen and martha were busily at work in the garden End of chapter 4chapter five of fern's hollow this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org fern's hollow by hesba stretton chapter five miss anne so these the only master here said tim when he came up the hill next evening according to his promise to help stephen in his garden and i'm the missus chimed in martha but i can't say how long it may be afore we have to pack off and she gave tim a very long account of the master's visit the day before finishing a description of stephen's conduct in a tone of mingled reproach and admiration and he never said a single curse at them not when they were out of hearing exclaimed tim i couldn't answered stephen i knew what i ought to do then if i wasn't quite sure about fighting thee tim my chapter says swear not at all and let your communications be yea yea nay nay for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil what's the meaning of that asked tim opening his eyes widely father said it meant i was to stand by my word like a man but not swear about it if i said i to mean i and if i said no to mean no and stick to it there'd be no room for telling lies i reckon said tim reflectively of course not replied stephen that it never answered down yonder said tim nodding towards the distant village i tell thee what lad i'll come and quarter with thee and help thee to be master it'd be prime only maybe the victuals wouldn't suit me last sunday afore thy father's buryin we'd a dinner of duck and green peas and leg of lamb and custard puddin and ale martha doesn't get a dinner like that for thee i reckon no answered stephen shortly maybe it wouldn't suit but what more is there in thy book asked tim whose curiosity was aroused and stephen proud of his new accomplishment a rare one in those days among his own class would not lose the opportunity given him by tim's inquiry for the display of his learning he brought out his bible with alacrity and read his chapter in a loud clear sing-song tone while tim overlooked him with his red face growing redder and his eyebrows arched in amazement and martha leaning against the doorpost glanced triumphantly at his wonder already though his father had been dead only a week stephen began to miscall many of the harder words but his hearers were not critical and the performance gave unbounded satisfaction that beats me cried tim what a headpiece thee must have stephen but what does it all mean lad is it all english like how can i know answered stephen somewhat sadly there's nobody to learn me now and it's very hard there's the pharisees tim and racker 
i don't know who they are the conversation was stopped by martha suddenly starting bolt upright and dropping two or three hurried curtsies the boys looked up from their book quickly and saw a young lady passing through the wicket and coming up the garden walk with a smile upon her pleasant face as she met their gaze my boys she said in a soft kindly voice i've been sitting on the bank yonder behind your cottage and i heard one of you reading a chapter in the bible which of you was it it was him cried tim and martha together pointing at stephen and you said you had no one to teach you continued the lady now would you learn well if i promised to teach you stephen looked up speechlessly into the smiling face before him he had never read of the angels and scarcely knew that there were such beings but he felt as if this fair and sweet-looking lady with her gentle voice and the kindly eyes meeting his own was altogether of a different order to themselves i am mr wiley's niece she added and i have come to limit botfield for a while could you manage to come down to mr wiley's house sometimes for a lesson please ma'am said martha who was not afraid at all of speaking to any lady although she dare not face the master he wants to turn us out of our house and he hates stephen because he won't give it up so he wouldn't let you teach him anything then you are stephen fern said the lady i heard my uncle talking about you your father was buried at longville church on sunday i saw the funeral leave the churchyard and i looked for some of you to come in for the evening service now stephen do you tell me all about your reason for not letting my uncle buy your cottage then stephen with some hesitation and a good deal of assistance from martha told the whole history of his grandmother's settlement upon the solitary hillside only withholding the fact of his grandfather's transportation because tim was listening eagerly to every word miss anne listened too with deep attention and once or twice the tears rose to her eyes as she heard of the weary labours and watchings of the desolate woman and when stephen repeated his resolution to work hard and constantly for the maintenance of his grandfather and little nan yes i will be your friend she said reaching out her hand to him when he had finished even if my uncle is your enemy god has not given me much power but what i have i will use for you and you must go on striving to do right stephen i can't read much replied stephen anxiously and martha can't read at all but i hope we shall all get safe to heaven knowing how to read will not take us to heaven said miss anne smiling but doing the will of god from the heart and the will of god is that we should believe in the lord jesus and follow in his steps yes ma'am answered stephen my chapter says whosoever shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven but whosoever shall do and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven stephen you know your chapter well said miss anne i don't know anything else he answered so i'm always studying all that in my head up here and down in the pit he's always mighty solid over his work ma'am said tim pulling the front lock of his red hair as he spoke to the young lady stephen do you know that you have a namesake in the bible asked miss anne no sure exclaimed stephen eagerly it was the name of a man who had many enemies only because he loved the lord jesus and at last they hated him so much as to kill him he was the very first person who ever suffered death for the lord's sake give me your bible and i will read to you how he died miss anne's voice was very low and soft like sweet music as she read these verses 
and they stoned stephen calling upon god and saying lord jesus receive my spirit and he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice lord lay not this sin to their charge and when he had said this he fell asleep stephen listened breathlessly and his face glowed with intense interest but he was not a boy of ready speech and before he could utter a word tim burst in before him with a question please is there a tim in the bible he asked yes answered miss anne smiling again he was a young man who knew the bible from his youth that ain't me however said tim in a despondent tone there is nothing now to prevent you beginning to know it continued miss anne listen as stephen cannot come to me at botfield you shall meet me in the red gravel pit at nine o'clock on a sunday morning as long as the summer lasts and i will teach you all bring little nan with you stephen down the same narrow green pathway trodden by the feet of stephen's angry master and his brother the evening before they now watched the little light figure of the young lady as she slowly vanished out of their sight when the gleaming of her dress was quite lost stephen rubbed his eyes for a moment and then turned to martha and tim is she a real woman dost think he asked a real woman repeated martha rather scornfully of course she is and it's a real silk gown she had on i can tell thee spirits don't go about in silk gowns and broad daylight never as i heard tell of lad end of chapter five chapter six of fern's hollow this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org fern's hollow by hesba stretton chapter six the red gravel pit at the entrance of the lane leading down to the works at botfield there stood a small square building which was used as the weighing house for the coal and lime fetched from the pits and as the pay office on the reckoning saturday which came once a fortnight upon the saturday evening after his interview with the master stephen loitered in the lane with a very heavy heart afraid of facing mr wyley lest he should receive the sentence of dismission from the pit he did not know what he could turn his hand to if he should be discharged from what had been his work since he was eight years old for even if he could get a place in one of the farmhouses about as wagoner's boy he would not earn more than three shillings a week and how very little that would do towards providing food for the three mouths at home fearful of knowing the worst he lingered about the office until all the other workmen had been in and come out again jingling their wages but the master and his brother thomas had been taking counsel together about the matter mr wyley was for turning the boy off at once and reducing him to the utmost straits of poverty but his more prudent brother was opposed to this plan look here brother james he said if we drive the young scamp to desperation there's no telling what he will do ten to one if he does not go and tell a string of lies to some of the farmers about here or perhaps to the parson at longville and they may make an unpleasant disturbance nobody knows and nobody cares about him as it is but he's a determined young fellow or i'm mistaken better keep him at work under your own eye and make the place too hot for him by degrees before long you'll catch him poaching with his dog and if he's let off for a time or two because of his youth and goes at it again we can make out a pretty case of juvenile depravity without any character from his employer you know and so he'll be sent out of the way and boarded at the expense of the country for a few years or so well said the master i'll try him once again 
if he'd go out quietly nobody else has any claim upon the cottage and i want to set to work there quickly so when stephen entered the office with trembling limbs and a very pale face under its dusky covering it happened that he met with a very different reception to what he expected the master sat behind a small counter upon which lay stephen's twelve shillings the only little heap of money left and as he gathered them nervously into his hand he wondered if this would be the last time but his master's face was not more threatening than usual and he muttered his thank you sir and was turning away with a feeling of great relief when mr wiley's harsh voice brought him back again trembling more than ever have you thought any more of my offer fern he asked i shouldn't mind as you're an orphan and have two sisters depending upon you if i made the ten pounds into fifteen and you may leave the money at interest with me till you're older and i've been thinking stephen added thomas wiley who sat at a high desk checking the accounts that as you seem set against being separated instead of taking your grandfather into the house i'd get him two shillings a week allowed him out of it and that would pay the rent of a nice two-room cottage down in butfield close to your work come that would make all of you comfortable you should bear in mind stephen said the master that the place does not of right belong to you at all and the lord of the manor is coming to shoot over the estate in september and then i shall have orders to remove you by force so you had better take our offer please sir said stephen bowing respectfully don't be angered with me but i can't go from what i said afore father told me never to give up fern's hollow and maybe he'll hear tell of it in heaven if i broke my word to him i can't do it sir well will full will have his way said mr thomas nodding at the master and as neither of them addressed stephen again he left the office amazed to find that he was not forbidden to return to work on the following monday the red gravel pit where miss anne had promised to meet her scholars on sunday morning was a quarry cut out of the side of one of the hills from which the stones were taken for making and mending the roads in the neighbourhood the quarry had been hollowed out into a kind of enclosed circle only entered by the road through which the wagons passed all along the edge of the red rocks high overhead there was a coppice of green hazel bushes and young oaks where the boys had spent many a sunday searching for wild nuts and hunting the squirrels from tree to tree stephen and tim met half an hour earlier than the time appointed by miss anne and by dint of great perseverance and strength rolled together five large stones under the shadow of an oak tree and placed four of them in a row before the largest one as tim had once seen the children sitting in the village school at longville when he had taken a donkey load of coals for the schoolmaster martha came in good time with little nan both in their new black bonnets and clean cotton shawls and all were seated orderly in a row when miss anne entered the red gravel pit by the wagon road i need not describe to you how miss anne heard stephen read his chapter and taught tim and martha and even little nan herself the first few letters of the alphabet after which she made them all repeat a verse of a hymn and when they could say it correctly sang it with them over and over again in her sweet and clear voice until stephen felt almost choked with a sob of pure gladness that would every now and then rise to his lips tim sang loudly and lustily getting out of tune very often but little nan was a marvel to hear so soft and sweet were her childish tones so that miss anne bade her sing the verse alone which she did perfectly martha too was full of admiration of the lady's lilac silk dress and the white ribbon on her bonnet and that was the first of many pleasant sunday mornings in the red gravel pit when the novelty was worn away martha discovered that she had too much to do at home to be able to leave it so early in the day and tim sometimes overslept himself on a sunday when most of his comrades spent the whole morning in bed but stephen and little nan were always there 
and their teacher never failed to meet them nor did miss anne confine her care of the orphan children to a sunday morning only sometimes she would mount the hill during the long summer evenings and pay their little household a visit giving martha many quiet hints about her management and her outlay of stephen's wages hints which martha did not always receive as graciously as they were given miss anne would read also to the blind old grandfather choosing very simple and easy portions of the bible especially about the lost sheep being found as that pleased the old shepherd and he could fully understand its meaning in general miss anne was very cheerful and she would laugh merrily at times but now and then her face looked pale and sad and her voice was very mournful while she talked and sang with them once even when she bade stephen good evening an exceedingly sorrowful expression passed across her face and she said to him i find it quite as hard work to serve god really and truly as you do stephen there is only one helper for both of us and we can only do all things through christ which strengthen us but stephen could not believe that good gentle miss anne found it as hard to be a christian as he did everything seemed against him at the works the short indulgence from hard words and hard blows granted him after his father's death was followed by what appeared to be a very tempest of oppression it was very soon understood that the master had a private grudge against the boy and though the work people were ground down and wronged in a hundred ways by him so as to fill them with hatred and revenge they were not the less willing to take advantage of his spite against stephen his work underground which had always been distasteful to him compared with a shepherd's life on the hills was now made more toilsome and dangerous than ever while black thompson followed him everywhere and all day long with oaths and blows stephen's evident superiority over the other boys was of course very much against him for he had never been much associated with them as his distant home had separated him from them excepting during the busy hours of labour now when through his own self-satisfaction and tim's loud praises his accomplishments became known it is no wonder that a storm of envy and jealousy raged round him for not only the boys themselves but their fathers also felt affronted at his wonderful scholarship to be sure tim never deserted him and his partisanship was especially useful on the bank before he went down and after he came up from the pit but below in the dark dismal passages of the pit many a stripe unmerited fell upon his bruised shoulders which he learned to bear the more patiently after miss anne had taught and explained to him the verse but he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed still stephen feeling how hard it was to continue in the right way and knowing how often he failed to his own sore mortification and the rude triumph of his comrades wondered exceedingly how it was possible for miss anne to find it as hard to be a follower of christ as he did End of chapter 6、Chapter 7 of Fern's Hollow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fern's Hollow by Hesba Stretton. Chapter 7 poor snip the middle weeks of august were come sunny sultry weeks and from the brow of the hill all the vast plain lying westward for many miles looked golden with the corn ripening for harvest the oats in the little field had already been reaped and the fruit in the garden gathered and sold by martha had brought in a few shillings which were carefully hoarded up to buy winter clothing 
it was now the time of the yearly gathering of bilberries on the hills and the tribes of women and children ascended to the tableland from all the villages round it was the pleasantest work of the year and martha who had never missed the bilberry season since she could remember was not likely to miss it now even little nan could help pick the berries and she and martha were out on the hillside all the livelong summer day their dwelling on the spot gave them a good advantage over those who lived down in botfield and each day before any of the others could reach the best bilberry wires they had already picked a quart of the small purple berries fresh and cool with the dew of the morning only the poor old grandfather had to be left at home alone with his dinner put ready for him which he was apt to eat long before the proper dinner hour came and then he had to wait until stephen returned from his work or martha and little nan were driven home by the august thunderstorms martha was wonderfully successful this year and gained more money by selling her bilberries than she thought necessary to show to stephen though on his part he always brought her every penny of his wages ever since their father's funeral there had been a subject of dispute between the brother and sister martha was bent upon enclosing the green dell with its clear cool little pond and to this end she spent all the time she could spare in raising a rough fence of stones and peat round it but stephen would not consent to it and neither argument scolding nor coaxing could turn him he always answered that he had promised the master that he would not trespass on the manor and he must stand to his word whatever they might lose by it though indeed he saw no harm in making green fields out of the wasteland martha on her side maintained her right as the eldest to act as she judged best and moreover urged the example of her thrifty grandmother who had planned this very enclosure and whose pattern she was determined to follow but before long the dispute was ended and the subject of it became a matter of heart-troubling wonder for several labourers from the master's farm began to fence in the very same ground as well as to prepare the turf behind fern's hollow for the planting of young trees and neither stephen nor martha could hide from the other that these labours made them feel exceedingly uneasy i say stephen said one of the hedgers as he was going down from his work one evening and met the tired boy coming up from his i'm afeard there's some mischief brewing there's master and mr thomas and mr jones the gamekeeper been talking with thy grandfather nigh upon an hour there'll be an upshot some day i know and jones he said summat about leaving a keepsake for thee what could it be william asked stephen anxiously how should i know said the man with some reluctance only lad i did hear a gun go off and i never heard snip bark again though i listened for him stephen stephen dunna of thee go so mad like but it was no use shouting after stephen as he ran frantically up the hill snip was always basking lazily in the sunshine under the hedge of the paddock at the very point where he could catch the first sight of his young master after which there was no more idleness or stillness in him stephen could hardly breathe when he found that snip was not at the usual place to greet him but before he reached his home he saw it the dead body of his own poor snip hung on the post of the wicket through which he had to pass he flew to the place he tore his own hands with the nails that were driven through snip's feet and then without a thought of his grandfather or of his own hunger he bore away the dead dog in his arms and wandered far out of sight or sound of the hateful cruel world into one of the most solitary plains upon the uplands anyone passing by might have thought that stephen was fast asleep in the last slanting rays of the sun which shone upon him there some time after the evening shadows had fallen upon botfield but a frenzy of passion too strong for any words had felled him to the ground where he lay beside snip the gamekeeper who had so many dogs that he did not care for any one of them in particular 
had killed this one creature that was dearer to him than anything in the world except little nan and grandfather and martha and snip was dead without remedy and no power on earth could bring back the departed life oh if he could only punish the villain who had shot his poor faithful dog but he was nothing but a poor boy very poor and very helpless and friendless and people would only laugh at his trouble all the world was against him and he could do nothing to revenge himself but to hate everybody why lad why stephen what ails thee said black thompson's voice close behind him eh who's gone and shot snip that rascal jones i'll go bail is he quite dead stephen stand up lad and let's give a look at him the boy rose and faced black thompson and his comrade with eyes that were bloodshot though he had not shed a tear and with lips almost bitten through by his angry teeth both the men handled the dog gently and carefully but after a moment's inspection thompson laid it down again on the turf it's a shame he cried with an oath that sounded pleasantly in stephen's ears it was one of the best little dogs about i'd take my vengeance on him for this in thy place i couldn't sleep till i'd done something ay said stephen with flashing eyes i know where he's keeping a covey of birds up against game day nineteen of them i've seen them every day and i could go to the place in the dark that's a brave lad said black thompson he's got his father's pluck after all as i always told thee davies and we'll see him righted he's got eyes in his head has this lad they're down in the leeso between the first penny and ragliff hill continued stephen and they're just prime i can tell ye and i know too what he doesn't know himself i know to some black game far away up the hill he'd give his two eyes to see them with their white wing feathers and if he hadn't stephen stopped with quivering lips for he could not speak yet of snip's murder never take on my lad said black thompson clapping him on the back we'll spoil his sport for him come thy ways with us it'll be dark dusk before we gain the spinney and jones is off to the whitehurst woods to-night we'll have as rare sport as the lord of the manor himself thee are a sharp one i'd lay a round wager now thee knows where all the sheep of the hillside fold of nights ay do i answered stephen walking briskly beside black thompson i know every walk and every fold on the hills ay and many other sheep themselves i keep my eyes wide open out of doors i promise ye i'll swear to that said black thompson glad to encourage the boy in his foolish boasting on their way they passed near to fern's hollow and stephen heard little nan's shrill voice calling his name as if she were seeking him weariedly but when he hesitated for a moment his heart yearning to answer her black thompson again patted him on the back and bade him never show the white feather but remember poor dead snip at which his passion for revenge returned and he pressed on eagerly to the fir coppice it was quite dark when they entered the path leading through the wood no one spoke now and they trod cautiously lest there should be any noise from their footsteps the tall black fir trees towered above them to an unusual height and through all the topmost branches there ran a low mournful sound as if every tree was whispering about them and lamenting over them even the little brook which in the sunshine rippled so merrily along the borders of the wood seemed to be sobbing like a grieved and tired child in the night-time strange rustlings on every side and sudden groanings of the withered boughs in some of the pines made them start in fear and once in a little opening among the trees when the stars came out and looked down upon them stephen would have given all he had in the world to be safe at home with little nan singing hymns on his knee or quietly asleep after the hot and busy day it's lonesome enough to make a bulldog afeard whispered davies in a frightened tone but before long they were out of the wood and in the glimmer of light that lasts all night through during the summer stephen saw black thompson unwind a net 
which had been wrapped round his body under his collier's jacket more than half the covey of partridges were bagged and they had such capital luck as the men called it that stephen soon entered into the daring spirit of the adventure it sent a thrill of excitement through him in which poor snip was for the time forgotten and when about midnight black thompson and davies said good night to him at his cottage door calling him a brave fellow and giving him a fine young leveret with a promise that he should have his share of whatever money they received for their spoil he entered his dark home where every one was slumbering peacefully and without a thought of sorrow or repentance was quickly asleep himself End of chapter seven chapter eight of fern's hollow this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org fern's hollow by hesba stretton chapter eight stephen and the gamekeeper martha's exclamation of surprise and delight at seeing the leveret was the first sound that stephen heard in the morning but he preserved a sullen silence as to his absence the previous night and martha was too shrewd to press him with questions they had not been unused to such fare during their father's lifetime and it was settled between them that she should come down from the bilberry plain early in the afternoon to make a feast of the leveret by the time of stephen's return from the pit all day long stephen found himself treated with marked distinction and favour by black thompson and his comrades to some of whom he heard him say in a loud whisper that stephen would show himself a chip of the old block yet at dinner they invited him to sit within their circle where he laughed and talked with the best of them and was listened to as if he were already a man how different to his usually hurried meal between the horses that worked like himself in the dark close passages but did not like him ascend each evening to the grassy fields and the pure air of the upper earth stephen had a true tenderness in his nature toward these dumb fellow laborers and they loved the sound of his voice and the kindly patting of his hand but somehow he felt as if they knew how he had left his faithful old snip unburied on the open hillside where black thompson had found him in his passion the evening before he was not sorry for what he had done he would avenge himself on the gamekeeper again whenever there was an opportunity even now he promised black thompson when they were away from the other colliers to show him the haunts of the scarce black grouse which would be so valuable to the gamekeeper and he enjoyed black thompson's applause but there was a sore pang in his heart as he remembered dead snip unburied on the hillside supper was ready when he reached home and what a savoury smell came through the open door quite down to the wicket of course snip was not watching for him and little nan also instead of looking out for him as usual was waiting eagerly to be helped for as soon as stephen was seen over the brow of the hill martha poured her dainty stew into a large brown dish and she had already portioned out a plateful for the grandfather few words were uttered for martha was hot and rather testy and stephen felt a sullen weight hanging upon his spirits only every now and then the old grandfather chuckling and mumbling over the uncommon delicacy would call stephen by his father's name of james and thank him for his rare supper good evening said miss anne's voice and as the light from the doorway was darkened all the party looked up quickly and stephen felt himself growing hot and cold by turns your supper smells very nice martha there's been some good cooking done to-day oh miss anne cried martha colouring up with excitement and fear it is a young leveret miss jones the gamekeeper's wife gave me for some knitting i'd done for her she said it'd be a treat for grandfather i've been cooking it all evening ma'am 
and it's very toothsome if you'd only just taste a mouthful it'd make me ever so proud thank you martha said miss anne smiling i am quite hungry with climbing the hill and if it's as good as the bread you gave me the other day i shall enjoy having my supper with you stephen scarcely heard what miss anne said to him while he watched martha bustling about to reach out a grand china plate which was one of the great treasures of their possessions and he looked on silently as she chose the daintiest morsels of the stew but when she moved the little table nearer to the door and laid the plate and knife and fork upon it before miss anne he started to his feet unable to sit still and see her partake of the food which he had procured in such a manner don't touch it don't taste it miss anne he cried excitedly oh please to come out with me to the bent of the hill and i'll tell you why but don't eat any of it he darted out of the door before martha could stop him and ran down the green path to a place where he was out of sight and hearing of his home waiting breathlessly for miss anne to overtake him it was some minutes before she came and her face was overcast and troubled but she listened in silence while without concealment but with many bitter and passionate words against the gamekeeper and excuses for his own conduct he confessed to her all the occurrences of the night before every moment his agitation increased under her quiet mournful look of reproach until as he came to the close he cried out in a sorrowful but defiant tone oh miss anne i could not bear it do you remember she asked in a low and tender voice how poor snip used to follow me down to this very spot and sit here till i was out of sight i was very fond of poor old snip stephen yes her voice trembled and tears were in her eyes the proud bulwark which stephen had been raising against his grief was broken down in a moment he sank down on the turf at miss anne's feet and no longer checking the tears which had been burning in his eyes all day he wept and sobbed vehemently until his passion had worn away and now said miss anne sitting down beside him i must tell you that though i am not surprised i am very very grieved stephen if you knew your bible more you would have read this verse in it god is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it did no way of escape open to you stephen then stephen remembered how he had heard dear little nan calling piteously to him as he passed fern's hollow with black thompson and how his heart yearned to go to her though he had resisted and conquered this saving impulse you do not know much continued miss anne but if you had followed out all you do know instead of poaching with black thompson that you might revenge yourself for snip being killed you would have been praying for them that persecute you the bible says that not a sparrow falls to the ground without our father so god knew that poor snip was shot but why did he not hinder it asked stephen speaking low and distinctly stephen said miss anne earnestly suppose that i lived in a very grand palace where there were many things that you had never seen and i wanted little nan to come and live with me not as a servant but as my dear child would it be unkind of me to send her first to a school where she could learn how to read the books and understand the pictures and play the music she would find in my palace even if the lessons were often hard and some of her schoolfellows were cruel and unkind to her would it not be better for her to bear it for a little while until she was made ready to live with me as my own child the young lady paused for a few minutes while stephen pictured to himself the grand palace and little nan being made fit to live in it and when at last he raised his brown eyes to hers bright with a pleasant thought she went on in a quiet reverential tone perhaps we could not understand any of the things of heaven so our father which is in heaven sends us to school here we are learning lessons all our life long there is not a single trouble that comes to us 
but is to teach us the meaning of something we shall meet with there we should not be happy to hear the angels singing a song which we could not understand because we had missed our lessons down here oh miss anne cried stephen i feel as if i could bear anything when i think of that only i wish i was as strong as an angel patience is better than strength said miss anne in a tone as if she were speaking to herself patiently to bear the will of god and patiently to keep his commandments is greater and more glorious than the strength of an angel black thompson was so kind to me all day to-day said stephen sighing and now he'll be ten times worse if i go back from telling him where the black game is you must do right replied miss anne with a glance that brought back true courage to the boy's heart and remember that blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven now good night stephen go and bury poor snip while there is still daylight in some quiet place where you can go and think and read and play sometimes stephen returned to the hut for a spade and then went with a strange blending of grief and gladness to the place where he had left his poor dog he chose a solitary yew tree on the hill for burial ground and dug as deep a grave as he could among the far spreading roots it was strange only such things do happen now and then that while he was working away hard and fast with the dead dog lying by under the trunk of the yew tree the gamekeeper himself passed that way he had been in a terrible temper all day for he had discovered the mischief done down in the fir coppice and the loss of his carefully preserved covey the sight of stephen and dead snip irritated him though a feeling of shame crept over him as he saw how tear-stained the boy's face was mr jones said stephen i've something to say to you be sharp then replied the gamekeeper and mind what you're about i'll not take any impudence from a young rascal like you it's no impudence answered stephen only i know to some black game and i wanted to tell you about them black game he said contemptuously a likely story there's been none these half dozen years it's four years since answered stephen i remember because grandfather and i saw them the day mother died when little nan was born i couldn't forget them or mistake them after that they are at the head of the black valley where the quaking noise begins i'm sure i'm right sir you're not making game of me asked jones laughing heartily at his own wit well my lad if this is true it will be worth something to me Arky, i'm sorry about your dog and you shall choose any one of mine you like if you'll promise to keep him out of mischief i couldn't have another dog in snip's place replied stephen in a choked voice at any rate not yet thank you sir well said the gamekeeper shouldering his gun and walking off i'll be your friend young fern when it does not hurt myself End of chapter eight Chapter nine of Fern's Hollow This is a Librivox recording. All Librivox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit Librivox.org. Fern's Hollow by Hesba Stretton Chapter nine Homeless of course stephen's brief term of favour with black thompson was at an end but whether miss anne had given him a hint that the boy was under her protection and had confessed all to her or because he might be busy in some deeper scheme of wickedness he did not display as much anger as stephen expected when he refused to show him the haunts of the grouse or go with him again on a poaching expedition stephen was more humble and vigilant than he had been before falling into temptation he set a close watch upon himself lest he should be betrayed into a self-confident spirit again 
and tim's loud praises sounded less pleasantly in his ears so that one evening he told him with much shame into what sin he had been led by his desire to avenge snip's murder unfortunately this disclosure so much heightened tim's estimation of his character that from time to time he gave utterance to mysterious hints of the extraordinary courage and spirit stephen could manifest when occasion required these praises were however in some measure balanced by martha's taunts and reproaches at home the shooting season had commenced and the lord of the manor was come with a number of his friends to shoot over the hills and plantations he was a frank pleasant-looking gentleman but far too grand and high for stephen to address though he gazed wistfully at him whenever he chanced to meet him on the hills one afternoon martha saw him and the master walking towards fern's hollow where the fencing in of the green and of the coppice behind the hut were being finished rapidly and she crept with stealthy steps under the hedge of the garden until she came within earshot of them but they were just moving on and all she heard of the conversation were these words from the lord of the manor you shall have it at any rate you fix wily at a peppercorn rent if you please but i will not sell a square yard of my land out and out how martha and stephen did talk about those words over and over again and could never come to any conclusion about them it was about noon on michaelmas day a day which was of no note up at fern's hollow where there was no rent to be paid and martha was busily hanging out clothes to dry on the gorse bushes before the house when she saw a troop of labourers coming over the brow of the hill and crossing the newly enclosed pasture they were armed with mattocks and pickaxes but as the peaceful little cottage rose before them with blind old fern basking in the warm sunshine and little nan playing quietly about the door sill the men gathered into a little knot and stood still with an irresolute and ashamed aspect they know nothing about it said william morris look at them as easy and unconcerned as lambs i was afeard there'd be an upshot when the master were after old fern so long i don't half like the job and stephen isn't here he does look a bit like a man and we could argue with him but that old man and that girl they'll take on so i say martha shouted a bolder-hearted man hasn't the master let thee know thee must turn out to-day he wants to lay the foundation of a new house and get the walls up afore the frost comes on and we're to come pick the old place to the ground he only told us an hour ago or we'd have seen thee was ready i don't believe thee thee's only romancing said martha turning very pale the old place is our own and no master has any right to it save stephen it's no use wasting breath replied william morris the master says he's bought the place from thy grandfather lass and he agreed to turn out by noon on michaelmas day master doesn't want to be hard upon you and he says if you've no place to turn into you may go to the old cabin on the upper cinder hill till there's a cottage empty in botfield and we'll help thee to move the things at once we're to get the roof off and the walls down afore nightfall grandfather and little nan screamed martha get into the house this minute it's no use you men coming up here on this errand you know grandfather's simple and he hasn't sold the house how could he he's no more sense than little nan no no you must go down to the works and hear what stephen says you're a pack of rascals every one of you and the master's the biggest and you'll all have to gnash your teeth over this business some day i reckon by this time the old man and the child were safely within the house and martha springing quickly from the wicket where she had kept the men at bay followed them in and barred the door before any one of the labourers could thrust his shoulder in to prevent her they held a consultation together when they found that no arguments prevailed upon her to open to them to which martha listened disdainfully through the large chinks but vouchsafed no answer come come my lass 
said william morris soothingly it's lost time and strength thee contending with the master i don't like the business but our orders are clear and we must obey them thee let us in and we'll carry the things down to the cinder hill cabin for thee if thee won't open the door we'll be forced to take the thatch off i won't answered martha not for the lord of the manor himself the house is ours and i wear any of you to touch it go down to stephen and hear what he'll say if thee takes the thatch off thee shan't move me out but when the old stove-pipe through which the last breath of the household fire had passed was drawn up and the blue sky could be seen through the cloud of dust and dirt with which the hut was filled choking the helpless old man and the frightened child martha's courage failed her and she went out with little nan clinging round her and spoke as calmly to the invaders as her rising sobs would let her you know it's grandmother's own house she said and the lord of the manor himself has no right to it but i'll go down and fetch stephen if you'll only wait we daren't wait martha answered morris kindly and it's no use lass the master's too many for thee but thee go down to stephen and we'll move the things safe as if they were our own and put them where they'll not be broken and we'll take care of little nan and thy poor old grandfather tell stephen we're desperately cut up about it ourselves but if we hadn't done it somebody that has no good will towards him would have taken the job so go thy poor ways with thee my lass we are main sorry for thee and stephen the hot choking smoke from the lime kiln was blown across the works and the dusty pit bank was covered with busy men and boys and girls shouting laughing singing and swearing when martha arrived at botfield she was rarely seen at the pit for her thrifty and housewifely habits kept her busy at fern's hollow and the rough loud voices of the banksmen the regular beat of the engine the clanking of the chains and the dust and smoke and heat of the almost strange scene bewildered the hillside girl she made her way to the cabin a little hut built near the mouth of the shaft for the use of the people employed about the pit but before she could see tim or fix upon any one to inquire about stephen from a girl of her own age but with a face sunburned and blackened from her rough and unwomanly work and an uncouth dress of sackcloth which was grimed with coal dust came up and peered boldly in her face why it's miss fern she cried with a loud laugh miss fern esq of ferns hollow come to learn us poor pit folk scholarship and manners here lads here's mr stephen fern's fine sister as knows more nor all of us put together give us a bit of your learning miss fern i know a black bess when i see one replied martha sharply and all the boys and girls joined in a ready roar of merriment against bess thompson whose nickname was the common country name for a beetle that'll do they shouted she knows a black bess thee's got thy answer bess thompson what brought thee to the pit asked bess fiercely we want no scatter-witted hill girls here i can tell ye so get off the pit bank afore i drive thee off what's all this hullabaloo inquired tim making his appearance at the cabin door why martha what brings thee at the pit come in here and tell me what's up now tim listened to martha's tearful story with great amazement and indignation and after a few minutes consideration he told her he had nothing much to do and he would get leave to take stephen's place for the rest of the day so as to set him free to go home at once he left her standing in the middle of the cabin for the rough benches round it looked too black for her to venture to take a seat upon them and in a short time he shouted to her from a skep which was being lowered into the pit promising her that stephen should come up as soon as possible it seemed a terribly long time to wait amid that noise and dust and every now and then black bess relieved her feelings by making hideous grimaces at her when she passed the cabin door but stephen ascended at last very stern-looking and silent for tim had told him martha's business 
and he hurried her away from the pit bank before he would even listen to the detailed account she was longing to give even when they were in the lonely lane leading homewards and she was talking and sobbing herself out of breath he walked on without a word passing his lips though his heart was sending up ceaseless prayers to god for help to bear this trial with patience poor old home there was all the well-used household furniture carried out and heaped together on the turf chairs and tables and beds looking so differently to what they did when arranged in their proper order the old man with his gray head uncovered was wandering to and fro in sore bewilderment and little nan had fallen asleep beside the furniture with a trace of tears upon her rosy cheeks but the house was almost gone the door sill where stephen had so often seen the sun go down as he rested himself from his labours was already taken up the old grate round which they had sat all the winter nights that he had ever known was pulled out of the rock and all the floor was open to the mocking sunshine it is a mournful thing to see one's own home in ruins and a tear or two made a white channel down the coal dust on stephen's cheeks but he subdued himself and spoke out to the labourers like a man i know it's not your fault he said and they stood round him making explanations and excuses but you know grandfather could not sell the place i'll get you to help me carry the things down to the cinder hill cabin the sheep and ponies are coming down the hill and there'll be rain afore long and it's not fit for grandfather and little nan to be out in it you'll spare time from the work for that ay we will cried the men heartily and submitting kindly to stephen's quiet directions they were soon laden with the household goods which were scanty and easily removed two or three journeys were sufficient to take them all and when the labourers returned for the last time to their work of destruction stephen took little nan in his arms and martha led away the old man while the sound of the pickaxes and the crash of the rough rubble stones of their old home followed their slow and lingering steps over the new pasture and down the hillside towards botfield End of chapter nine